and welcome to Tremendous Tales with Liz Pichon. That's me. This is a brand new podcast for children and grown-ups can listen to. I write and draw children's books like the Tom Gates series and Shoe Wars. But for this podcast, I'll be chatting to some brilliant guests about lots of very important things like snacks (laughs) in Snack Chat. (laughs) We get to hear a tremendous tale from every guest and also a tremendous fail because everyone makes mistakes. You can join in and play What's That Sound? And I'll be reading a few of your letters and finding out what tremendous creative things that you've all been up to. Right now, let me tell you about my fantastic, talented, funny, tremendous guest, the author and illustrator, the Horrible History series, Martin Brown. Martin was born in Melbourne, Australia, and has lived in England for over 30 years, and he lives in Dorset with his family now. Arriving in London in 1983, Martin got a job as a bicycle courier without any knowledge of the capital's geography. (laughs) Yeah, we'll talk to him about that afterwards. It was (laughs) short-lived. This was followed by a role in Harrods toy department. Achievements included caricaturing customers and successfully wrapping a fully-sized rocking horse. That's a skill, I think. While working at the London Graphic Centre, Martin decided to pursue his dream to become a cartoonist. Having access to contact details of every publisher helped. One of the first publishers he contacted was Scholastic, who commissioned him for the coping with books before uniting him with Terry Deary to create the world's best-selling children's history series, Horrible Histories. Martin has illustrated Horrible Histories for 28 years and the series has sold over, this is incredible, 30 million copies, inspiring the award-winning CBBC series, hit stage shows, attractions and even a feature film which came out in 2019. Martin's recent books include Lesser Spotted Animals series by David Fickling Books and Horrible Histories Up in the Air with Scholastic. An advocate for Drawing Is For Everyone in his lively events, Martin inspires children and their families everywhere to pick up a pencil and start drawing. So Martin, welcome. (laughs) Thank you so much. That's absolutely incredible, all those books that you've sold. And I have to say, I've been to one of Martin's events and he is incredibly funny and very inspiring. So... Yeah, because we I went to your um your book launch, do you remember? Yes. For lesser spotted hi, animals. Hi, hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> what does it feel um, like when you hear all those books that you've sold as well? Gobsmacked, I think is the word. Because you you just do something because it's fun and then yeah. other people seem to like it. And then <laughs> twenty eight years, really? Um I know. Yes. That's <laughs> how I feel. <laughs> uh, no, amazed, amazing. Um uh, I feel incredibly lucky to do something that I I love doing, uh, that I have fun doing, and other people seem to like it too. Yeah, I bet you when you first started doing the books, did you ever think that you'd be still, that it would be like 28 years later that you'd have been been drawing all those books? No, in fact, when we first started, I was still doing uh, some of the coping with with books. And so there was a couple of the early horrible histories that I didn't do. Because, right. of course, no one knew that it go, we'd get, they were going to sell 30 million copies. So yeah, well, I you, was. You know, you hope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we did the first two and we thought we'd see how they, they went. And then we did the second two and we, we thought we'd see how they went. And then a couple more after that. And then a couple more after that. And then it just <laughs> kind of went crazy. So tell us about your. Um... Uh, the courier, the driver. I, I can just imagine you doing that. It's the kind of thing that you do when you're younger, isn't it? You say, yeah, I can do that. I, I have no idea where I'm going, but there you go. Well, I arrived in London with zero money and so <laughs> needed a job. And I think it was the day after I arrived or the you know, day after that, I was, you know, I didn't know London for toffee. And I just land, I knew someone, I must have met someone who had a job and said, come along, we just always need people on bicycles. So... They gave me an A to Z and a bag full of mail and said, off you go. Should we, and I, should we explain what an A to Z is? Oh, uh, Probably, yes. Before the days of <laughs> um, of uh, mapping on your telephone, you, you carried around a little book, which was the, a map of all of London uh, laid out page after page after page. And it was you're like your Bible. You, you couldn't get around London without it. It was a mm. tiny little atlas, I suppose. A so street it's perfect atlas. to have a book. It's perfect to have a book to look at when you're on a bike. 
yeah, I know. No, um, <laughs> safety first, always. Yeah. Uh, so I had to deliver things like matinee tickets. But I was going from South London to North London because I didn't know where the streets were. And then <laughs> I, I knew things were really going wrong when I was delivering matinee tickets, which should have been there at midday at five o'clock in the afternoon. Oh. <laughs> so so I, I thought, this probably isn't my job. No, I was just talking about um, the book launch that you invited to me to, and I put up a picture on social media of the armadillo that you had, do you remember? And I've actually put that yeah. book, I've put that photograph. It's actually in the back of... Um, it's in the back of one of the Tom Gates books. There you go. Yeah, I saw it. It's magic. <laughs> but that that uh, that launch for Lesser Spotted Animals was magical. We had uh, a, a little African hedgehog, if you remember. And I remember and I, there was a lemur. Uh, there was a. I was carrying around on my back a raccoon. I had a raccoon on my shoulder. It was a raccoon. Oh, yes. that's right. It was a raccoon. It was stripy. Yeah. Yeah, it was stripy. And uh, there were all sorts of things. <laughs> I think he he, uh, he had about half a dozen different little creatures. We arrived a bit later and I was kind of handed a sleeping armadillo and and just sort of sat there. And I thought, oh, yes, I'll, I'll hold that little armadillo. Oh, my God, that's so cute. It was like literally in a little round ball. And as they passed me the armadillo that was sleeping, I suddenly, the smell suddenly hit me. <laughs> <laughs> the look on my face wasn't just that I was holding an armadillo. I was thinking, oh, my God, this armadillo absolutely... Pongs, <laughs> just like, yes. and I was studying it. it. Had all these sort of like little hair, hairs. It was so weird, like holding this breathing animal. But um, so there you go. Yeah. So I, I like to think that the armadillo was thinking the, um, the same odd things about <laughs> me as well. <laughs> Snack chat. Well, everyone, it's time for me to introduce you to the world's finest food. Now, if excellent, you're from Australia, you know about these things already. Uh, you have crisps and uh, by the way in australia uh, crisps are called chips now right. if you wanted fish and chips like potato chips that come with fish they're called hot chips uh if you want just a bag of crisps they're called chips so don't confuse chips and hot chips anyway back to yeah. twisties it's a That's... bit like sweets and lollies exactly Exactly. We have similar but different words for things. Um, a lolly <laughs> is uh, an icy pole. Uh, no, that's right. An, a, an icy Lollies pole in Australia sweets, is... Lollies are aren't they? Well, a lolly is also the thing you get in the summer with a stick in oh. it, isn't it? Oh, I don't know. I was going to say, I was very excited to get this packet of twisties, which I have, admit, I have actually already opened. Oh, you have? Well, I'm going to open yeah, it uh, for the full sound effect. Other crisps are available and carrot sticks too. Thus, look at that. I mean, this is what podcasts are all about: people eating yeah. snacks. Yes, they're now, very have you similar tried them to yet? something else. No, oh, aha. Uh -huh. mm. Ah, oh. And oh. you very kindly sent them to me in a little um, Tupperware box, which is very mm. reminiscent of a school snack as well. So these twisties, oh. I'll describe them. They're a bit like there is a there is a kind of snack already called knickknacks, and they reminded me of them. Cheesy, but they're very satisfying. They're like a kind of small wobbly. Um, What's it? If what's it had been scrunched up, and they're a little bit harder, yeah, and they're all slightly misshapen. So, and I like the slogan that they have, which is "Life is pretty straight without twisties." But did yep. you know that twisties were introduced in 1950, which is 71 years ago? <laughs> and a little extra fact about them: twisties were originally made in only cheese flavour. But chicken and wicked cheddar zigzag flavours were later introduced and became a standard part of the product line. Wait for this, Martin. There have also been flavours abroad as diverse as toffee, tomato, salmon yeah. teriyaki <laughs> and peri-peri, where the local palate suits them most. Twisties are eaten as a snack in themselves or sometimes in a sandwich of known course. as a twist. Twisty butty or twisty rolls by serving the packet contents between two slices of buttered bread or in a roll. That is something that I have done as well. So hang on. Oh my gosh. That's why I had to they open are them wonderful. earlier. So <laughs> oh no. Now I'm jealous. <laughs> oh, look at. Oh. <laughs> so listeners here, I've actually got some white bread and butter and put the twisties inside. Um, and if I'm honest, I've actually... Mark's pulling a face. 
<laughs> I was just going, oh my God, she's going to eat it. I am. I'm going to try this one. Hell. Mmm. Doesn't that sound wonderful? It's actually really... <laughs> of course no, it I is. Mean, I'm an advocate, you know, especially when I was a kid, I used to definitely... I'd have a cheese and onion. I'd have a crisp sandwich. Mm. Um, even if you're out and you get a posh sandwich and they bring you a little side order of crisps, I've been known to sneak the crisps into the sandwich just to give you a bit of extra crunch. Yeah, a bit of saltiness. I'm all of that. Hmm. So would this be your snack of choice when you were a kid as well? Uh, well, yeah, they're a bit special. I mean, you know, because we weren't into sort of buying snacks for ourselves. We weren't a big crisp family. Um, if I came home from school as one of those teenage boys with hollow legs, um, of course I'd eat there's bread and Vegemite, of course, which is the other great Australian staple, uh, the <laughs> second <laughs> finest food. <laughs> Oh, it is, Liz. You're just you're just wrong, basically. Mm. Yeah, if you like uh, the sort of taste of tar. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. There are there are there are people who uh, don't like Vegemite, and there are people who are correct. <laughs> uh, I'd love to talk to you about being in the Scouts and growing up in Australia, where rather than just going off into a farm somewhere, you'd actually go into the bush, and. There, there would be amazing animals. I, I remember encounters with wombats and possums, which would come down oh. out of the trees at night and for some reason eat our soap. So we'd have to <laughs> cover the soap at night. And, and of course, kangaroos and wallabies and all that. It's just we took it for granted because we could yeah. go out into the wild. It wasn't just farmland. It was proper wilderness. And, you know, we were a bunch of kids and we were very much left on, to our own devo devices. And just tho those encounters with animals is, is something I suppose I didn't even see as being special, but now I, I, I treasure it. I, I guess I want to talk about more is this idea about being able to draw or not. Mm -hmm. Because I, you know, we, we, as you say, we, we, we chat to each other in green rooms and things. And I, it'd be nice to be able to invite the kids in to see that what we do isn't particularly special in a way. Uh, yeah. The I get so, um, I was going to say annoyed. That's not true at all. It's so sad that... <laughs> get cross, that, uh, you? you get, I get cross. You get very cross, No, I... I <laughs> Furious. <laughs> I rage that <laughs> kids that are way too small to be self-conscious say things like, mm. I can't draw, mm. which is kind of weird because of course they can uh what they mean is they don't like what they draw i mean they, their yeah. horse doesn't look like a horse or their maserati doesn't look like a maserati but drawing horses or drawing maseratis is really hard <laughs> you know <laughs> i've been doing it for years and i can't draw it so i don't know why you you know uh, a young person should be able to do that and and People don't allow themselves the fun of drawing because their drawing doesn't look mm. perfect. It just made me think about, you know, growing up uh, in Australia, going to school, going to the normal local high school, the lo local primary school, like everybody does. Mm -hmm. And I like drawing. And what do you do if you like drawing? You do it more often. If you like playing football and you play football every single night after school, you're going to get better at it. If mm. you're Tom Gates and play the guitar all the time, you're going to get better <laughs> at playing guitar. That's just how it works. And it was exactly the same for me for drawing. And then I got lumbered, well, lumbered, but labelled with this title of being arty. You know, mm -hmm. I was the arty one. And so <laughs> aunt, aunties would give me drawing books or crayons or paper or pencils for birthdays. Did you feel like being the arty one was a kind of bad thing or you know it wasn't as good as being good at other things did it did anyone make you feel like that no it was, it was nice to be good at something because I, I wasn't yeah musical or I wasn't I really wasn't sporty it certainly didn't have the kudos of being a sportsman you know they were always the cool kids the the arty ones were always the weirdos and the sporty ones were the cool ones <laughs> but I, it, even then it struck me that how come you, you have to be one or the other, <laughs> you know. Mm. Why do you have to be yeah. arty or sporty or musical mm -hmm. or arty or uh, 
academic. You know, it was kind yeah. of weird. And and even then, I thought this is weird. And all through school, I I loved doing art, so I did it a lot. And if you do it a lot, you get better. And so yeah. And then、uh, here I am doing it for a living. And kids are saying, "Oh, I." Twenty eight. <laughs> It's still fun. That's the thing. Yeah. And then, you know, kids say, "I can't draw," and it's it's sad, and it does make me slightly cross because it's all there. It's like picking up a guitar or、mm, learning how to play a sport. There are techniques, but I, I'm not sure if anyone actually teaches the techniques. You can't draw a horse. You know, accurately, without learning how to, just like you can't play a guitar without learning what to do with your left hand. Yeah, it's really interesting because I always felt like there's a big difference. You know, at primary schools there is, and nurseries, and think there is that love of doing creative things and just making things with paint, and and then somewhere along the line, some something happens where kids think that what they've done doesn't look the right way, or. Hasn't、exactly. doesn't come out the way that they think. Doesn't look exactly. And I remember very clearly in secondary school, an art teacher who gave us、uh, the inside of a green pepper to draw, <laughs> like, pretty、oh, quickly.、Gosh. And there were so many kids in the in the class that just went, oh, you know, I can't draw this. And their shutters, the the shutters go down,、yep. and they just、yep. went, oh, I can't draw. That's it. It's not for me. And then we had another art teacher who came in, and did what she called soft sculpture. So we did looked at pop art, and we made、um, junk food out of different objects. So hamburgers from bits of polystyrene painted, and she showed us how to make the buns. And then we made, you know, chips, and we sort of made all these different things. And all of a sudden, the kids that didn't think that they were good at art or anything were making these incredible things. And、yep. I always feel like there's lots of different ways to do. Design and art and create and you can draw and some people are really amazing at drawing and some people are really good at other things and it's just sort of inspiring. It's just finding something that you really enjoy and that you can make things because you know my drawing. I never think that my drawing is no. I mean I you know your drawing is amazing <laughs> and I feel like that now. You know I go to events where I see people other artists and I think like I'll never be able to draw like that. But you find a way to tell your stories and to create things in a different way, and there's lots of different ways. There's no one right way to do stuff. No, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And I'm the same. I, I go to events and I, I see people draw kind of off the cuff, and I'm thinking, "Oh, crikey, how do they do that?" <laughs>、uh, but of course, they've been doing it all their lives as well. I mean, I, I, I can、yeah. watch Chris Riddell draw. All、yeah,、day. why did I know? I knew we were going to talk about Chris because we. <laughs> <laughs> whenever I have to do events. And he's going to come onto the podcast and talk as well. And I love the fact he always calls his drawings doodles. And I'm like,、yeah. it's not a doodle. <laughs> 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 he draws every single day. Yeah, and, and and he's just honed his talent to perfection. So he's going to be good at it. That's that's how it works. So the teacher who handed you that half a fruit, it's the same as handing you a guitar that you've never seen before and saying play.、Mm. You know, without showing you how to draw, it's it's too much to just. Set you a task and say, "Go ahead and play it." That's a and, really good、uh, point. And as if drawing realistically is the only way to draw. You think、mm. of the,、um, you know, the people we know in in the、uh, children's book world. How many of them draw realis- realistically? The most successful illustrators in the world don't draw a horse that looks like a horse. Nick Sharat、mm-hmm. doesn't draw elephants that look like elephants.、Um, Axel Scheffler doesn't draw. You know, mice that look like mice. They're 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 cartoons. They're they're yeah, drawings. Yeah, Axel Scheffler, as you say, did、be. the Gruffalo. Yeah, isn't it the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? His work is just stunning. It doesn't have to look realistic.、Though. I did feel very guilty, and I met him once, and I he, he signed a book for me, and I did feel like、um, when I asked him, "Could you draw a Gruffalo?" <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> 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 like it's and that the only thing he gets asked to draw. Well, that's a really brilliant tr- and inspiring, tremendous tale. I think of just telling children that you know your all the animals and things that you saw when you were younger, how you've used those and how they've come into your work now, and then just the love of drawing, how you've managed to sort of you know kept on going, and、um, the more you do it, like you said, the better you get at it and having fun. We approve. Tremendous story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well. It was more of a tremendous rant. <laughs> Maybe that'll be the next section. 
<laughs> Tremendous <laughs> rant. So, okay, we'll, we'll do this quickly then. So we are going to play What's That Sound? <laughs> Martin's face. Uh, yeah. like, <laughs> we're not expecting you to know, but you know, take a little guess though. It has got something to do with what we've been talking about. Uh, that is someone doing an impersonation of a lemur who's been locked in uh, when the shop has closed. <laughs> I think that's exactly what would happen. Okay, well, we'll come back to that later. So have a listen at home and see if you think you know what that is and we'll play it again and let you know exactly what the answer is. Tremendous fail. Do you have a tremendous fail, Martin, that you'd like to share with us? I, of course, all failures uh, must be embraced, but I'm like, <laughs> celebrated, I'm not so sure. Any number of drawings that haven't quite turned out the way I wanted them to. Not sure about this whole drawing being right or wrong. I don't like that. My drawing mm. doesn't look right. My horse doesn't look right. But sometimes they don't look sort of the way you'd quite wish them to. I use a lot of um, pencil when I'm drawing and uh, often rubbing it out a lot. I rub out quite a lot of my drawing. Half my drawings <laughs> don't exist anymore. But we talked about um, events and, and green rooms and, and doing things in, in schools and festivals. And they are some of my favourite times to be able to mm -hmm. talk to the people who who read the books and buy the books and just meet everyone and, and, and talk about the things we love. And occasionally, I, I don't know if it's happened to you, we, we might get invited along to speak to grown-ups and to teachers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was invited along to a teacher's conference one time uh, out west, in, I think it was in Devon, and um, I thought, oh, I can do this, you know, I'll make a few <laughs> notes. I'll do my usual talk. I'll talk about the importance of drawing technique and blah, 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 and, you know, my usual. So I started talking, and then people put up their hands and asked questions. And so I answered the questions. And then I realized that because I'd answered those questions, I lost my place. And I sort of froze Having done events in front of kids and 10-year-olds and 12-year-olds and 8-year-olds, for years and years and years, I had this mm. room full of 30 and 40-year-olds and I <laughs> cr crashed and burned. It was, it, was, it was awful. I just I lost my place. I didn't know what to say. I had to try and read my notes, but my notes all oh. of a sudden made no sense whatsoever. They were suddenly written in Swahili and <laughs> I just kind of ground to an ignominious halt. So what did you learn from that? Just don't assume that because you think you know what you're doing, that it's all going to turn out perfectly well. <laughs> that, like um... now. <laughs> like us. <laughs> yes, doing this yes. podcast. Don't think assume. About that... <laughs> <laughs> think of how this is, how good this is going to be about 10 podcasts <laughs> from now. <laughs> It's more to do with us, Martin, that's all. <laughs> no, I mean, I know exact. I, I've been in exactly the same, same position where I, did, I had no idea when you first start doing books. You know, you do your book, that's what you do. Mm. And then you suddenly start to get um, invited to go and talk about them. And I'd never done anything like that. And the thought of public speaking used to make me feel physically sick. The first time I ever did a drawing live in a classroom, my, I picked up a pen um, to use the, or the, or use the whiteboard. And my hand was shaking so much, I had to put it back down again. <laughs> and it just, you know, you suddenly find yourself in these situations that you, yep. especially for me, I mean, I was, I'm dyslexic as well. So I had these oh. terrible memories about having to read out loud in class in front of teachers and schools. And it just brought back every kind of terrible memory. And then you start to find a way, you start to think, actually, people just really want to hear you reading it and talking about what you're doing and there's not that you know nobody's expecting waiting for you to fail <laughs> like, and if you no. do make a mistake it it doesn't you know you can usually try and come back from it in some way but it did take me a really long time to actually feel comfortable doing that and I still don't especially when I'm doing stuff in front yeah. of other authors as well like you <laughs> <laughs> but it's it, yeah that's you, the, the day you're not nervous before going on stage is the day that it all goes wrong because you need that kind of tension, I think, to 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 make you slightly 
super focused so that you're yeah you're, and then if you do something too often you can get well you said you're you're dyslexic i just a few months ago online i was doing one of my talks about lesser spotted animals and i finish off with getting the kids to make a poster of their own animal of their choosing be it whatever they like and, and sort of make a a save the animal poster uh you know save the whale sort of thing and the one I chose was uh, something called a pika, this little rabbit-like creature that lives in mountains. And I did the drawing, and I was writing underneath, save the pika. Big letters, right, you know, right in front of the camera. But I didn't write save the pika. I wrote safe the pika. <laughs> and it's just, and it's, there's no way back. If I had written it, it was already there. I, I couldn't start mm -hmm. the recording all over again. So I just sort of had to shrug my shoulders and say, whoops, and, you know, sorry, I'm dyslexic and, you know, but I'm human. Oh, you and are too. That's interesting. I did exactly the same thing on a live world, uh, Blue Peter thing that I did. <laughs> um, I, was, I, I was writing World Book Day and I spelt something wrong and, and then tried to fix it. <laughs> and it was like, yes, it's it was all you late. can do. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think that's Scribble a very good. It. So failure sometimes you always sort of learn. It's not the end of the world and you always learn something from them. Failure is just, it's kind of handy. It really is. I learned more from that encounter with teachers than kind of mm -hmm. any other event I've ever done. And I'm very yeah. grateful. It's for like it. you learn to go in and you think, okay, I'm just going to be a little bit more prepared than I was before. <laughs> if nothing <Yes>. else. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> okay, shall we have another listen then to our What's That Sound and see if you can if you've got any other amazing suggestions of what it could be. No, okay, yeah, yeah, I was wrong. It's someone doing an impersonation of a cat stuck in a shop. <laughs> it could be. It does sound very cat-like, actually. It is, in fact, an armadillo. It's a screeching armadillo. <laughs> oh, it's, oh, God, so one of those is actually in my book, but I hadn't heard well, one go. before. Wow. There you go. It really is. It's like a screeching armadillo, and it could be. that that's, It might sound like that if it's trapped in a shop, but that's what it sounds like. <laughs> Yeah, um, I've got a letter here that I'd like to read out. It's from Sophie. And I'm sure like you, you get sent loads of amazing letters. I mean, I can't believe, you know, I could never be bothered to write to anyone when I was a kid. So when people do actually write, I'm always amazed at how much time and trouble they take. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, this one's from Sophie and it says... Um, on my picture, I drew one of my favourite teddies as a ballerina. I also have a, three dogs and one of them, uh, which is mine, is called Bingo. And I just picked that one out because I thought that's such a brilliant name for a dog. And the others are my aunts. And you've inspired me to do more doodling. Thank you for your fantastic lesson. I must have done a lesson of some kind. So she's done a drawing, which I'll post up there. I'll show you, Martin. There's uh, her ballerina oh, wow. dog. And uh, I like the other little dogs that she's drawn as well. So that one's from Sophie. I like um, Bingo. Bingo, yeah, I particularly picked that one out because I thought that's a really good name for a dog. Bingo, Is Bingo, Bingo. Bing, Bingo looks like he or she might be a short-legged creature, um, possibly a dachshund. It could be, yeah. She's got nice, Bingo's got nice long ears. And the other one, this is a little bit what you're talking about. This is from Liam and Reese. And I put up colouring sheets and things on my website, especially after lockdown. And they sent me loads of pages that they'd coloured in. But oh, what wow. I thought was interesting about their letter was the one that they drew themselves. So they coloured in all the ones that I sent. But the one I liked the best, so I'm just rustling away here, is the one that they made up themselves. Yeah. So there you go. That's very much like what you were saying. You know, they've, they've used my drawings as a basis to do something, but actually the one that they made themselves, I thought was really excellent. And I'm sure you get lots of children um, copying your drawings and inspired by drawings of animals that you do as well, Martin. Yeah, it's 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 always amazing and, and kind of humbling to 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 get letters from from kids and and especially with drawings uh, because you can see that, that there's a lot of <laughs> There's a lot of love in there. There's, there's a lot of care and attention that goes into them. I don't feel like I read out Liam and Reese's letter quickly. It just said, during 
the first lockdown, me and my little brother made kites, fish biscuits, and all kinds of things from the Tom Gates books as well. This isn't just a plug for the Tom Gates books. I'm just saying it was interesting that they... No, lovely. They were, you know, they were making things and cooking and doing things like that as well. So thank you Biscuits for made out in. of fish, I'm not entirely sure about. Or are they biscuits <laughs> shaped like fish? They're, well, Granny Mavis in the book is... She's very keen on putting very unusual combinations of food together. I remember. <laughs> so she yes. makes fish biscuits, but they actually, they're one of the few things that don't, that taste okay, that Tom doesn't mind. Tea and so, cornflakes makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or custard and a carrot stick as well. <laughs> Do you have a tremendous book that you would like to tell so us about, Martin? My favourite books or the book I'd love to tell everyone about, is a, is a how to draw cartoons. Because Brilliant. if you want to, or if you love drawing and you want to draw more, if you want to be better at drawing, then pick up something that shows you how. And mm -hmm. there is a brilliant one, How to Draw Horrible Science by T Tony DeSoules. Now, it's not just because I know Tony. It's not just because it's uh, <laughs> another horrible. Because uh, the horrible you a little envelope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> checks on the post. Uh, <laughs> but this wonderful book does precisely what I would like to do in a book myself if I was to ever make a how-to-draw book or do a how-to-draw book. It starts with the, the simplest sort of wobbly cartoon shapes. Even if right. you can't draw a circle, you can still draw. I was holding so Martin's that in front holding of the, the book up. But we'll make sure we'll take a picture of that and we'll put that up on the the public. So yeah, I mean that's that that looks like have you still got the book that your mum gave you then? I have. I have. It's it's sort of old and I don't have it here, unfortunately. Right. Um and unfortunately. It's old can't... and decrepit. <laughs> yes. Were you gonna say it's old and decrepit? I was gonna like I know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a bit it's a bit threadbare and a bit brown, and the pages are all yellow. But it's still wonderful. It was called Fun with a Pencil by a guy called uh, Andrew <laughs> Loomis. <laughs> I'm just laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> I, 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 so I, no, I, I can't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't recommend it highly enough, uh, but really I can't recommend it at all uh, because <laughs> it was done back in the time when uh, people thought differently about I I used to copy from things. comics. Yeah, I used to copy from comics and stuff. And there was this really weird thing that if you used any, if you used tracing paper, like it, there was a bad thing that like your teachers would yeah. tell you, like, oh, you know, don't trace, you know, you shouldn't be tracing, it's cheating. And I used to think, that's how you used to learn. Like you know, you trace something or you copy something, and then you yep. get to learn how a, you drew an eye or a face or something, yep. and then you'd learn how to do it yourself, and then you'd start adapting it. So I always used to think it was a bit weird, like that. You know, that's cheating. And like, why? Yeah. We, we got, <laughs> if and then when you go to art college, the first thing they do is they send you into a gallery to copy the masters. Well, that's yeah, the same yes. thing. You know, <laughs> it, we got these silly rules. Whatever helps you learn what. If you if you trace over a drawing of a bird, you're learning the shape of the bird. It's it's a brilliant thing to do. That's a really good tip as well. Shameless plug. So this is your opportunity for a shameless <laughs> plug, Martin. Take it away. Thank you. I still have horrible histories coming out. I say still. They're, they're wonderful. There's a one coming up to do this summer. The last one. Uh, that came out was called Up in the Air, which, as the name suggests, is all about the history of flight. And the thing about I have it here. the history of flight... Ah, yes. I will take um, pictures and let people know. To learn how to fly, I mean, to, to, to get off the ground in the first place, those early pioneers of the air, of course, there was quite a lot of falling down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so... Uh, it, it is a perfect, horrible history. Um, there was a, a lot of people that kind of quite literally did crash and burn. And then there's the, the new covers. We're relaunching the entire range with these wonderful new newspaper style covers. So I'm very excited about those. Um, I did Lesser Spotted Animals 1 and 2 a couple of years ago. Yes. But I'm still 
Oh, plugging well, those I've my, because I've got my copy. Oh, great. Yeah, Lesser Spitz. Because they have, yeah. well, we say that it's the brilliant beasts you never knew you needed to know about. Because most, I was going to say, most children's natural history, most natural history books uh, across the board have the same old animals in them over and over and over again. It's lions and tigers and polar bears and pandas and yada, yada, yada. Mm-hmm. But there's thousands of different mammals out there. And I, a long time ago, I, I thought, well, if the tiger was going extinct, there'd be a huge fuss, a great stink, and rightly so. I mean, how would, mm-hmm. who would want to live in a world without, without tigers in it? But if the you know, crested Filipino moon rat went extinct, no one would give a monkey's. Oh. Which is, I think, just as sad. Uh, so I wanted to make a book, a, a non-fiction book about real animals that uh, are that they're, how contain those creatures you've, you've you've not heard of before. Uh, wonderful things called the, like the southern uh, right whale dolphin, and if you ever see a picture of a southern right whale dolphin, mm-hmm. you'll think. Oh, my God, why wasn't I told? How could something this striking, this amazing be in the world and us not even know about it? And there's so many wonderful creatures out there that I just thought it's it's time for their place in the sun. It's, I've just and, opened and, it up on a I've opened it up on a page here and I've got lesser fairy armadillo straight away. Oh, there so you are. Your, yeah, so which you never know. So this is your book, Martin Brown's Lesser Spotted Animals, The Brilliant Beasts That You Never Needed to Know About and the Little Creatures. You never knew you needed to know about. Um, you never knew you needed to know about, exactly. <laughs> it's hard to say. <laughs> so I, I, I want to do a Lesser Spotted Animals 3 because there's so much out there. So that's something that I would love to do. I've also, of late, been dabbling... In fiction, uh-huh. oh, um, and I've written my first novel. It's it's for quite young readers. It's called Nell and the Cave Bear, and it comes out in September. And it's and about who's a little girl. By? It's that's published by Bonnia Books, Bonnia Children's Books. Oh, it's right. a well Pic- Piccadilly Press. Excellent, and that's coming and out in September. And this is is this September. your fir- this isn't your first my first fiction novel book, is it? My first fiction. Is it? Yeah, wow. I loved it. I I, oh. ha- I had such a good time writing it. Um, I had the idea for it years ago, but I did had no idea how to do it. And it's a it's a lovely sort of gentle story of a a cave girl and a pet cave bear who run away um, and end up on a log floating down the river. Where oh. at one point uh, they're saved by mammoths. They're but, so well, you know, <laughs> mammoths. <laughs> mammoths, excellent. Mammoths, well, yes. So that that's coming know, out in get, September. Yeah, uh, but I, I love. I, to be honest, I'm a bit. You know the fuss that's made over writers. You know, <laughs> writing that was. You've been controversial, daughter. Martin. No, well. Drawing, you know this, drawing is so much harder than writing. I mean, all the, oh, gosh, whenever the writers are gathered, it's kind of like, oh, you poor dears. I mean, that writing, I loved every minute of it. I'm, I'm going to do more writing. In fact, I'm writing the second Nell and the Cave Bear uh, as we speak. The rest oh, of today fantastic. I'm going to be settling down to that. And it's just such fun to write. And uh, oh. I, 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 I don't know. And what age group I'm, is it for? Uh, sort of quite young, sort of six, seven, eight, sort of thing. Because it's, it's a gentle story, and it's a, uh, it's not terribly long, and it's got lots of pictures. Brilliant, and it's got well, we'll absolutely. We'll look forward to seeing that. I'm sure we'll be, I'm sure we'll be seeing that around the bookshops in September. It's exciting. We'll be able to actually go out and um, and meet people and go and sign books I and know. everything. So hooray so that's martin's shameless plug thank you very much for that thank you so much martin it's been an absolute delight to chat but i say before you go i know that you have a gold blue peter badge already <gasps> i know you do I because do. you i'm not wearing every, everyone seems oh to have it and you wear it quite which you haven't got on i'm not gonna but do not fear it's because in recognition for all the amazing work that you've done with horrible histories and all the other incredible books that you've made I would like to present you with a very rare and extremely special, valuable award. Are you waiting for this? We will have a drum roll. 
Wow. None other than your very own gold Tom Gates badge. Oh, my badge. God. And here it is. Ah. Unfortunately, you haven't got it with you. <laughs> that is the right reaction. <laughs> oh, Wow. So I'm going to be sent to you by flying unicorn delivery, obviously, or a screaming. <laughs> it's going to be sent to you by a screaming armadillo. <laughs> Yay! And you can. I will know what prize. it sounds like now. <laughs> oh, I will wear that with pride. I mean, look, there's a. There you go. I don't know how many gold blue Peter badges that are out there. There's probably hundreds by now, but <laughs> how many of those are out there? That is not oh, very many. So please. <laughs> so thank you so much for listening keep listening tell your friends um and until next time i'd like to say thank you again martin brown thank you so much Yay. thank you <laughs> bye bye everyone <laughs> <laughs>